won't carry on too long, so if you get bored, uh, daydream a little bit, and uh, you'll be free before you know it. Uh, but uh, anyhow, uh, I'll, I'll read the very short stories, uh, three of them. Uh, it will be maybe 35 minutes. We'll see. Um, and the first one is entitled, Why Not? And it goes like this. Uh, the town in which I grew up, uh, Daruvar, uh, was divided along many lines. Believers and non-believers, communists and anti-communists, Serbs and Croats. But these were all superficial divisions. The really deep and substantial one was between alcoholics and non-alcoholics. <laughs> I was informed early on that I belonged to the non-alcoholic camp. My father, mother and siblings, none of them drank. It was a little different with my uncles, one of whom fell off a barn after drinking plum brandy and broke his neck. In late adolescence, I didn't drink at all, and I poured some of my friends who did. I, I heard they got together, drank beer and brandy, and passed out. Others went to village fairs, had fist fights, got drunk, and had sex with village maidens in haystacks. Most of these were amateur drunks. A friend of mine, a few years older than me, informed me that alcoholism was a disease. First defined as such coincidentally in 1956, of my birth year, in the United States. Previously, alcoholism was just a phenomenon. Uh, Popovich, uh, when we called him Pop, uh, my friend, explained that there were all sorts of alcoholics, such as Zrakiashi, brandy drinkers, Pivashi, uh, beer drunks, and the worst of all, winers, Vinashi. Something in wine made those people hooked and incurable. I didn't know any winers, I said. Oh, you, you can recognize them easily, said Pop. They dehydrate, and when you see a man drink several glasses of water in the morning, you might look for the correlation of wine in the evening. Nobody needs to drink water in the morning except alcoholics, you know, it's not natural. <laughs> it turned out winers were not all that bad. Uh, namely, when I needed to visit Belgrade to take a test of English as a second language, I, uh, so I could apply to American colleges, I asked Pop if he knew where I could crash for the night. Uh, no problem, he said. I know a winer who has a little house in Zemun. Uh, how do I get in touch with him? Uh, do, I, uh, do I call him? Uh, oh, no, no, he's always home. He doesn't have a phone, of course. I'll give you the address. Just go there, bang on the door, and uh, he's hard of hearing. And say you're, you're Pop's friend. Give him a one-liter bottle of red wine, and you'll be best friends. Maybe he'll be in a good phase, maybe not. His father is an officer, but now and then the police who hate winos come over and slap him. For a while they came every morning and woke him up by slapping uh, him and kicking him. Uh, and his father probably arranged for that. I followed the Pop's instructions. It was snowy, windy February day. I came to a triangular square, found a little house with two shattered windows and banged on the door. Misho opened the door, tall, uh, disheveled, uh, with somewhat purple undersides to his eyes. I presented myself and he laughed. Josip, like Tito. He must be uh, Croatian. Uh, yes, unfortunately, I said, uh, I mean, here's some plavats from Pelješac for you. Uh, and tomorrow I, well, sorry, uh, Pop sent me here, and I have to take a test at the American Embassy tomorrow. At the American Embassy? Misha replied, by all means. We sat down and lit a petroleum lamp. I haven't paid the electric in a year, so the city has cut me off, he said. The petrol fumes and smoke drifted while Misha popped the bottle open and drank straight from it for a long while. Good, now we can talk. If you're tired, you can go right to bed. I shivered as the snow blew through the windows and the wind whistled cheap melodies over the shards of, of glass. Misha walked to the cupboard, yanked the glass door open, and took out a handgun. Do you want to check it out? Uh, he said. No, I'm fine, uh, I said. Uh, <laughs> it, it's really cold. I don't want to uh, leave the down covers. It's an interesting gadget, he said. My grandfather had a quarrel one day with my grandma. She was in bed just where you are, in the same bed at midnight like now, and he shot her. <laughs> Yes, my friend, he killed my sweet grandma right there. He sobbed and uh, threw the handgun on the floor. And he drank more wine. The snow blew through the cracked windows and I shivered. 
Would you like a sip? You need more wine. No, thank you, I replied. Somehow at that point I, I fell asleep. Maybe the secondary lows affected me. I woke up at dawn, found Misha asleep in the armchair covered by a large green officer's overcoat with a couple of shoulder stripes, probably his grandfather's from World War I. I walked out into the biting wind, caught the bus, and soon was at the American Embassy. The administrators all smiled, displaying their enviably white teeth, and gave me a B2 pencil to shade the ovals of the correct answers. They all drank water, and I eyed them suspiciously. <laughs> Soccer is not a, a big sport here, but uh, if you're a fan, football fan or any kind of fan, you, you understand the passion of rooting for a team. Uh, as I, I will read a very short story about hooligans, um, soccer hooligans in Croatia. Um, so uh, it's entitled Crossbar. On May 25, 2020, Dinamo Zagreb was trailing 1-2 to two against Crvena Zvezda Belgrade in the semi-final UEFA cup match in Maximir Zagreb. Ten minutes before the end of the regulation time, Milic, Zvezda's halfback, deflected the ball with his hand. The Dutch referee should have blown the whistle for a penalty. Is it possible that he didn't see the hand uh, and that the assistant referees uh, hadn't either, while the whole stadium had? The fans shrieked and uh, threw crackers and for a few minutes the match was suspended. Big guys around me kept jumping so that the cement stands shook. I have no idea how these guys grew up to be like bears. Most of them in the range of 6'2 and 6'6 six, six, and weighing between 250 and 350 pounds. It struck me as unseemly that such huge guys would be so passionate about what short and stringy fellows did in the grass with a few balls. You know, yet I was one of those guys, jumping and shrieking. Ordinarily, I was a civilized architect with a taste for macchiato and single malt. At the beginning of the match, I was still uh, civilized, but now, by the end, I had taken off my shirt and was hollering for blood. <laughs> the game became uh, frenetic. See, I'm cultured enough to use words like that. <laughs> and I'm even writing this whole thing in the damned English language. Uh, when I'm away from the stadium, but in it, I'm a Roman barbarian, uh, wanting to see gladiators kick balls like chopped heads and heads like balls. Dinamo exerted fantastic pressure, shooting at the goal almost twice a minute. And then there was a great chance as Hodgic passed all the players advancing to the goal. He was felled uh, by Branislav Ivanovic, who slid into his shins from behind. Ivanovic uh, is a fine player, Chelsea captain until recently, and I'm sure he intended to get the ball rather than the player, but at that speed it's impossible to be accurate always. Anyhow, it was a clear penalty. This time, uh, the stingy Dutch referee did whistle. Hodges, the new phenomenal player for Dynamo, got the honor to shoot. I knew Hodges uh, must have hated the Serbian players. Uh, he was born in 1992 in a Croatian village in Yugoslavia, in Bosnia, and both of his parents were executed in front of him. He was raised by his grandmother and as a refugee in Austria, and for him, eliminating Zvezda must have been a dream. He was a bony guy with sharp cheekbones and a long hooked nose. Uh, at the whistle, Hodge ran, took a full swing at the ball, and the ball flew straight and hit the inside of the crossbar in the right corner. The metal resounded. The ball bounced onto the line and back to the crossbar. The Zvezda goalie, instead of catching the ball, kicked it out and it landed on Hodge's chest. Hodge had another chance. He shot and yet again hit the crossbar. And the ball flew far out where Ivanovic cleared it, sending it into the stands. Now you have to admire Hodges' shots, even though they didn't go in. I think there should be a different scoring system whereby each one or each hit on the crossbar should count as a half a point. Three crossbar hits would have amounted to 1.5 goals and Dinamo would have made it. Anyway, the crowd was uh, in a wounded state. In the stinging smoke screen, uh, anything could go and it did. 
Many of us jumped over the fence, and right in front of me, I saw a man with a machete. Another grabbed the referee, a Dutchman by the august name Rembrandt, pushed him on the ground, on his knees, and uh, the first one brought the machete down, beheading him. Somehow it looked normal at first, easy. The head rolled and rolled and ended up sideways on uh, the grass, stopped by the hooked nose. I followed another group of hooligans uh, who got hold of Dynamo players, beating them systematically. Somebody knocked Hodges down and several people kicked him, shouting insults. One of them said, I have a better idea, let's take him to the zoo. I think I'd had a whole bottle of Hennessy during the game. <laughs> and instead of sobering up and, uh, up and seeing the beheading, I went along with the hooligans. Hell, I was one of them. I must admit I even gave Hodges a kick somewhere in the kidney area. And I was one of the guys carrying him to the zoo. The zoo had uh, modernized recently. It used to have barred cages, but now with Croatia being a member of the EU, the zoo had uh, to become more humane. And tigers got a bigger cage, an uh, acre of land with trees to sharpen their claws, with a little pond to drink water from and bathe in. And these were new Siberian tigers, Putin's present to Croatia. Putin had just retired in Croatia, having bought the island of Ugyen. Anyway, we tried to toss Hodzic over the fence into the cage, but the fence was too tall and Hodzic fell out of our hands onto the pavement. He, sh he shrieked, Shut up, you should have kicked that ball a little lower. Why go so high, you freaky ass? <laughs> Let's take him to the Grizzlies, someone would propose. These august creatures were a political present too, from Obama, uh, delivered by John Kerry, the foreign affairs minister, when he visited a couple of years before. Croatia had proven to be a faithful peon of NATO, uh, starting with smuggling arms for the Syrian rebels, sending peacekeepers into Egypt, and so on. There is a long tradition of presence uh, in the form of animals. Indira Gandhi gave Tito elephants, Mao Zedong, panda bears, so now we had grizzlies as well, named uh, Bill and Hillary. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, these guys were massive, male probably 800 pounds, female 450, even bigger than the Siberian tigers. We had to climb the fence to throw him down, and he landed on the rocks on a little island. Bill and Hillary jumped to the island and sniffed Hodges. We shouted, tear him, eat him. But the bears merely sniffed him all over for a while and then licked his face. They did not bite him. Hodges didn't move, uh, sprawled uh, and loose. Uh, Bill roared at us and jumped at us on the fence, but the fence was 10 yards removed over a chasm, so he fell in, and, uh, uh, climbed out, and growled at us and jumped out again. This uh, jumped again. This time he managed to reach the fence, uh, top of the fence, and climbed it and knocked down one guy and snapped his neck. I ran. He bit my right calf and tore it right up. I pissed in terror and ran out of the zoo and into the streets, and a cab driver gave me a ride to the Rebro Hospital. I bled and groaned until they cut off the circulation to my leg and gave me uh, uh, the shots to stop bleeding and morphing. At first it had hurt less than I imagined it should. Uh, shock is a natural painkiller, and that's how I managed to run for my life. At the hospital, I passed out from loss of blood and the morphine. When I woke up, I was uh, in horrifying pain. I, I stayed in the hospital for days. The surgeons patched me up, but without these muscles, it was clear I would limp for the rest of my life. At least I had the rest of my life. Online, I found a report that Hodzic had a broken spine, concussion, broken ribs, uh, and a ruptured kidney. He was in critical condition at the Rebro Hospital. Thank God we hadn't killed him. I swore I would never watch another soccer game and I would never root for any teams. Croatia, both individual teams and the national team, was banned from international competition for four years, anyway. If I hadn't been there, the same thing would have happened, no doubt. There were enough hooligans without me. Maybe I shouldn't feel guilty. When Hodges recovered enough to go around in a wheelchair, I volunteered to take him places. And we became fast friends. I took him to Gradska Kavan every morning for Macchiato. Because of spinal cord damage, he'll never walk again unless medicine improves. And uh, what do we talk about? Anything but soccer. 
for a whole year I couldn't bring myself to tell him that I was one of those tags, but one day we were relaxing in a prickly, fabulous mood. Let's go to the zoo, he suggested. I want to say hi to Bill and Hillary. <laughs> you know, he saved my life by licking me and nursing me. I, I think I was clinically dead. I saw my dad and mom in heaven and we ate baklava together. I think there's life after death. We took a cab. On the right side was the Dynamo Stadium. I helped him uh, get out of the cab with, the, with his electric stroller and we went past the Siberian Tigers to the Bears. I had no reason to be glad to see them, but Hodges shouted, Hello, my friends. Both bears stood on their hind legs and made strange noises, something between a growl and a roar, but a couple of octaves higher than usual. Beautiful, aren't they? He said. See, they remember me. Next time I'm going to bring them some trout. You aren't allowed to feed them, or I can do whatever I want. You'll help me get here? Of course. What would I do without you? He said. You know, Bill ate uh, my right calf. I'm not that eager to feed him. I already did. <laughs> I know, I've read the articles. You knew it all the way along? That's crazy. Uh, why would you talk to me? Yeah, I saw the picture, security cameras, uh, and I could tell that one of the silhouettes was you. And then there were articles about the bear, how he killed the hooligans and tore up your leg. And you don't blame me? Of course I blame you, you asshole, but I understand. <laughs> you were a fucking hooligan. You were known the ringleader. Anyway, all generous interpretation. Not generous. Uh, let me show you something. He leaned over, opened his jacket, and I could see he carried uh, an Uzi. Guess what that is for? Anyway, the, the story goes on, but this is a good point. <laughs> painful to just uh, listen to the same droning vo voice, uh, uh, so I'm taking a, a very, very short pause. Maybe, maybe you want to ask me a question, but, uh, and I'll answer very quickly, and then I'll read a little more. So just we can hear some of the other voice. You know. Okay. Are Bill and Hillary real names? And no. <laughs> no, but uh, you know, the, they, uh, the zoo did uh, get presents uh, from uh, various world leaders, uh, and uh, Indira Gandhi had given uh, two elephants uh, to uh, Tito Zoo on Brioni Islands, and uh, the elephants had actually outlived uh, Tito. So, uh, but uh, they, they died recently. Um, and um, uh, yeah, anything else? Yeah. Are the Croatians the worst soccer hooligans in Europe, or are they, they, how do they brag compared to the, the British or the French? Or oh, no, the, yeah, you know, uh, the, we try hard, but we are not that good. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, it, in, the, in the last World uh, Championship, uh, the Russian hooligans were the best. Uh, uh, they, uh, you know, the, the British hooligans are very proud of the English hooligans, uh, and they, they, uh, they're violent, and... Uh, uh, however, they were uh, systematically beaten by the Russians, and it turned out that uh, the, the Russian fighting clubs, uh, and that was actually uh, partly organized by Putin, were sending their best fighters, uh, so it wasn't all that spontaneous. They, they didn't do very well uh, in the stadium, but outside of the stadium, they, they were spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Croatian and Serbian hooligans, they... Uh, uh, they compete, the, frequently they earn, uh, earn, earn penalties so that uh, for like uh, the next three, four matches uh, we have to play without the audience uh, when, when the foreign teams come in. Uh, uh, then, uh, uh, yeah, you remember the incident with the Al uh, Albanian fans? Uh, uh, they, uh, in Belgrade, they, they flew with the drone, they flew, uh, uh, an Albanian flag, and then the whole stadium exploded. And uh, uh, well, anyway, it's uh, th there's always some kind of trouble. And uh, the story about the hooligans, I must say, I, it, uh, it partly I was inspired. It was much longer before. Uh, first half was a memoir. Uh, as a kid, uh, I ro rooted for Hajduk Split. My uh, brother rooted for Zvezda, the club that I write about here. Uh, 
Belgrade Club, and uh, he was uh, 12, I was 10. We went to watch the match and uh, to support him. I was actually, uh, I joined the group of hooligans, the Serbian hooligans, and we walked down the main street in Zagreb, uh, and I, I carried the flag of, of Zvezda. Uh, and, uh, you know, that uh, was kind of cool uh, until uh, a big rock hit me in the ribs. Uh, Somebody from the sidewalk uh, threw a rock. Uh, the, the flag fell out of my hands. Uh, I ran, ran, <laughs> ran away, uh, and, uh, and I thought, "Wow, this sucks." You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my brother was going to Belgrade, and, and the, uh, uh, he, he would get free tickets because I, they admired that he uh, came from so far away. And uh, anyway, we did not grow up to be hooligans. Uh, I, I immediately saw the limits of my talents there. <laughs> but okay, so I'll read another story. Uh, it, it's, it's also short. This, this one's about music and something else. You'll see. <clears throat> on Columbus in 106th Street in New York, opposite a hotel on whose yellow neon sign a green monkey leaped and hung by its tail uh, during the summer near a burnt-down cancer ward, I shared an apartment with three Juilliard students. At first there were four of us. My ex-Soviet roommate's brother was one. The two ex-Soviets, fresh from the exile camp in Vienna, spoke no English and didn't dare to leave the apartment. They spent the whole summer on the floor mattress wrapped in a white sheet, embracing, gazing at a small TV we had found in a garbage heap on the Upper East Side. The antenna sticking out like a V-sign could catch only one channel, which trembled and shifted up and down. When summer was over, the ex-Soviets stood up from the bed, speaking fluent English. The brother moved, uh, uh, the one brother moved out and opened an ESP therapeutic center in Chinatown. A French violinist slept on the floor in an alpine sleeping bag. Whenever he woke up, he rubbed his sweaty and hairy chest with a thick towel and his bloodshot eyes stared at us as though we were the Andean cannibals cooking him. We had no air condition. On hot days he woke up in puddles of his own sweat. I slept on the carpet from a rich man's garbage heap. The only one of us who had a real bed was a Swiss cellist who shaved twice a day and resentfully looked around him at the chaos the rest of us created with our clothes, uh, papers, breadcrumbs, utensils, Shoe shine boxes. Um, I easily got used to the bohemian atmosphere and paid no thought to, to how different it was from what I had expected America would be like. But as my roommates and I ran through our apartment after a rat, stumbling over ashtrays and beer camps, uh, sorry, beer cans, it occurred to me: Is this the way to live? Where are the cats? I didn't wish to chase the rodent. He looked like a veteran of many battles and that he was in the predicament of having a crew of Juilliard musicians after him <laughs> was no doubt the result of his observing us for a while and correctly assessing us to be a bunch of wimps. <laughs> he used to enter the kitchen at noon and charge the trash bag like a small boar, biting straight through the olive plastic in search of cheese crusts. We bought gourmet cheeses. Since we snorted no coke, we had to have some ways for recompense. <laughs> which tasted the way cow dung, uh, horseshoe, the pigsty, and the freshly cut grass smelled. Strange how you grow to like the foul taste, but the fouler the tastier. The Frenchman scoffed at us for liking the cheeses, which, according to him, were bland. The stench of cheese must have thrown our rat back to his rural roots. In the rat's first appearance, uh, appearances, it was enough to set your foot in the kitchen and hit scurry off, squealing. But after he had heard us playing Schubert string quartets, his caution vanished. <laughs> now he languidly rummaged through our garbage, looking fat and well-established, and with an air of dignity, he strolled into the living room for the afternoon intermezzo. <laughs> Schubert moved him. I, re I read somewhere that Bach moves plants. Schubert rooted our rat to the spot, making him tremble to the harmonics of minor keys, raising his hands so that he resembled a hedgehog. Now and then he stood on his hind legs, put his paws together like a squirrel praying for a pistachio. Perhaps he would have clapped his paws, but didn't dare out of piety for the music. 
that Todd and this meeting was his absolute favorite. We used to play it sometimes just to tease him. Then he'd come uh, quite close to the cello, his little beady eyes shone with tears, his uh, upper lips twitched, his little incisors pinching his lower lip. If he hadn't been so scrawny, his ears so small, his tail so thin and wet, he would have passed for a squirrel and would have been quite likable. Perhaps he wished to be. Perhaps he wished to make friends with us and uh, would have been proud of us. Perhaps he was proud of us. He may even have loved us. But, but we didn't appreciate him as the audience. After all, playing uh, to entertain a rat is not what you'd call a lustrous career. <laughs> Yet his listening uh, always uh, humored us and put a joie de vivre otherwise so hard to come by into the street. He's like, I, I will drink a little bit of water. <laughs> <laughs> not, not much longer ago. Still, we had to put a stop to his growing more and more brazen. Soon he would have been jumping on the table and dining with us. He would have grown so attached to us that he would have followed us on our dates. And suddenly he would have been unstoppable if he had known Schubert's unfinished symphony would caress the walls of uh, Avery Fisher Hall. Though I should think it per he would have preferred it at Carnegie Hall, where walls old and sandy must uh, be easier to bite your way through. We discovered that he feared Bartok. I don't know why he feared Bartok. Maybe he hadn't been educated well enough to take the stresses of modernity in music. <laughs> Though he kept up with other modernities and postmodernities as a New York City rat. Though Bartok made him run Helter Skelter for shelter, we couldn't keep playing Bartok just to keep a rat away. <laughs> Alone, none of us could have handled the uh, Handle him, but United, a Frenchman, a Yugoslav, an ex Soviet, and a Swiss, we dared to take him on. Actually, the Frenchman was away on a date with a woman from the fourth floor. He preferred a woman from the second floor, but one floor of elevated time was not enough for him to let her pick him up. <laughs> That's how he described it. Three floors of elevated time sufficed for a woman to pick him up. So the three of us intervened, like United Nations blue helmets uh, of sorts. And if the Swedish anti-communist and anti-feminist elite had given us a Nobel Prize for Peace, we could have done even better. As the rats strolled into our bathroom, we exchanged the uh, looks. It was too much. Now he would like to share our toilet. <laughs> the ex-Soviet jumped up and shut the bathroom door, swearing in Russian. The Swiss and I grabbed the table, the plate sliding and crashing on the floor. We borrowed the bathroom door, then we opened it. Over the edge of the table, Vian blows at the rat with a broomstick, a baseball bat, through which uh, we had tried to Americanize ourselves, <laughs> and an, an unscrewed table leg. Only two of us could fit in the door frame at a time, so we took turns. Mostly we missed. The Swiss struck him first with the broomstick, despite its being thin. Swiss precision, I guess, but less away from stereotypes. <laughs> the blow surprised the rat and incensed him. He shrieked and jumped toward us nearly the full height of the fence. I got goosebumps from the shrillness of his voice. We were almost ready to beat a retreat. Uh, the rat jumped again, right up to the edge of the table. As he was falling down, I struck him with a baseball bat, which brushed his back and scorched his tail on the tile, the tile breaking in half. Hardly a second later, the table leg struck him, blowing him off the floor. His body hit the heating pipe. Now he jumped with on any order, like a panicky frog, in such high leaps that he could have jumped over uh, the edge of the table. But he jumped left and right, and then uh, fell backwards into the bathtub. He couldn't jump out of uh, the slippery tub. We flung the table aside, the Swiss squealed, yowl, and we all jumped forward. Blood squirted, the animal of the tub cracked in many places. When he was finally dead, instead of triumphant, we were ashamed. We didn't look into each other's eyes. Slowly we swept the remains onto a Sunday New York Times magazine and put it into three olive garbage bags. We threw the package into a large rusty iron dumpster in, in somber mood. We washed the tub for days with all sorts of soaps. We threw away the clubs. Henceforth our table had only three legs. <laughs> None of us took baths anymore, only showers, <laughs> which of their own accord uh, changed from hot to cold to hot. 
there is hope that uh, the assassination would be after assassination we would be rat free we were wrong <laughs> a chap similar to our murdered friend began to appear but he didn't care for music we bought rat poison and put it in cheese either he, he didn't kill him or another rat indistinguishable replace him <laughs> at night there were constant noises coming from the walls scuffling of rats in their love work uh, and debates and muffled squealed one night a fire alarm went off we didn't bother to go out of our beds the alarm went off so often that it always seemed a prank but when hollering reached our ears and smoke our nostrils uh, we looked out the window pointed blue and orange tongues of fire licked the walls of our windows like tongues rolling over upper lips of, or after a greasy meal we grabbed our passports diplomas money and instruments leaving behind uh, uh, music scores and uh, pictures of family members and so on in long underwear we ran down the smoky stairs out of the building into the slushy snow rats leaped out the windows and thumped against the pavement <laughs> Waiting, I got such a frostbite on my large toe that for a while it seemed it would have to be cut off. And probably would have been if I had the good enough insurance. I still can't feel anything in the toe. An orange school bus took us to shelter, and some shelter it was. Uh, people sick beyond repair, derelicts, drunks, addicts, lunatics, fatal thieves who were still trying. We ran out of the stench and spent the night all rolled up in a bundle on a grating in a stream of urinated heat. Several days later, the Frenchman, the ex-Soviet and I moved back into our quarters. The Swiss cellist moved back to Switzerland. Although the building was now all sooty, the windows gaping black, our part was nearly intact. There were no rats, not for a year, when we filed a claim against our landlord in a small claims court demanding to be paid back several months of rent because there had been no hot water and heat. Although the landlord didn't show up in court, he won the case and evicted us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's basically there. How are we doing with time? What's, what was your clock set? Uh, or what? Uh, it's 12. It's 2.38. We've got a few, a few minutes there. Oh, okay, so uh, let's see. If you, if you want to ask me something or... or or the passage or something. Well, uh, maybe I'll just torture you a little bit uh, uh, with this story. Uh, maybe you'll regret you, you said that was <laughs> Okay. All right, that's <coughs> Wanderer is the title of it. Neda, a blue-eyed, uh, it's uh, set in Croatia as well, a blue-eyed 14-year-old with a swinging black ponytail was walking down the Brothers Wolf Street in Binkovci and posting black and white photocopies of a long-haired Persian cat. There was no need for uh, many colors as the cat was white uh, and uh, would be so in a color photo as well. The cat evinced uh, a pensive perhaps angry uh, or mistrustful expression so that if a passerby read the text, a three-year-old female cat lost, you find Mimi call. You might think he had deliberately run away. And that is what uh, a middle-aged man said, the startling Neda in English. Are you sure Mimi hasn't simply run away? She stared at the man's thick curly beard, his long salt and pepper hair, and the uh, crow's feet around his hazel eyes. Pretty cat, he said. I ran out of ticks. Sorry, uh, yeah, that's fine, ticks. No problem. The stranger stuck the paper to the red bark of a fir tree by its resin. The tree could have been uh, a good Christmas tree in its youth, but was now shaggy, its branches dying out, and it bore scars of shrapnel from the war a quarter century ago. The scars kept bleeding resin and failed to heal. Are you a refugee? She asked him. I've read a lot about refugees, but I haven't seen one yet. You look Syrian. You could say that. Why aren't you in a group? Maybe like your cat, I left the group. How did you get here? Across the Danube uh, and through the cornfields. But there were warnings that there could be mines there. Well, of course, of course. Where are you from? 
the man rolled his eyes. Uh, Wait a minute, uh, I see her. Just then, uh, the white cat meowed from the top of the weeping fir tree. The stranger climbed the tree swiftly. Some of the thinner branches cracked, he stepped on them, but he didn't lose his grip. He had a fear that the tree would split. The stranger gripped the cat by the scruff of her neck and climbed down. He didn't look where his feet went, uh, they seemed to have an intelligence of their own. When the man landed on the grass, Mimi kissed, as though not recognizing Neda. She grasped the cat and cried for joy, kissing uh, its ears. Thank you so much, uh, all uh, nothing to thank me for. Are you thirsty? she asked. Yes. Well, come home with me and I will give you a glass of water. When they came home, she shouted, Mom, we found Mimi. Mom, a lean uh, redhead came out and saw the stranger. And who is this? What are you doing here, sir? She asked in Croatian. I don't think he understands Croatian, uh, Neda said. You can talk to him in English. I can't speak English, she said, but maybe German. He found the cat uh, and so on. I'll, I'll skip a little bit. Uh, so, uh, basically, they give him uh, water and all that. And uh, he's about to leave. Uh, and uh, here, we have some bratwurst. Uh, he's hungry. We have some bratwurst, Mom said. I don't eat pork. Oh, well, look at him, Mom said. He's starving, but so finicky he won't eat pork. What next? <laughs> Gluten free? <laughs> well, Mom, they have religions like that, not to eat pigs. Uh, I'm glad we don't eat cats. <laughs> Mom brought out a jar of honey, some warm white bread and milk. The stranger said, uh, Danke schön, smiled, revealing his misaligned white teeth. How about some red wine? offered Mom. Is it against your religion as well? May I have a glass? The stranger poured water into his tall glass of ruby red wine. Uh, You're diluting it, Mom said. Oh, that's why there'll be more. He drank and kept pouring water into the glass and the wine stage will be refracting the light into swift arrows. The stranger sighed with relief and satisfaction while uh, sitting in the red living room fell asleep. Marco Neda's bold father showed up around 10 in the evening smelling of cigarettes and brandy. Who is this alcoholic bum on the sofa? <laughs> Neda was still up uh, posting uh, pictures of, of Mimi on Facebook. Dad, he's not a bum. He found my cat. But he reeks of uh, booze and sweat. I thought Muslims didn't drink wine. What kind of refuge is he? Well, uh, don't you think uh, you'd want a glass of wine after a hard journey like that? I wonder whether he took a boat from Turkey to Greece. Haven't you heard that uh, so far 600 people have drowned crossing from Turkey to Greece? Yeah, what's up with these uh, boats? Can these bounds walk on the water? Maybe they don't even have enough faith. And there's land connecting Turkey and Greece. There are bridges, aren't there? If they want to go to Germany and the Germans want them, why don't Germans just send a bunch of airplanes down and take them? He's not Muslim, but Jewish, he told us. Uh, and I'm sure he'd love a bath. That's ridiculous. There are no Jewish refugees. I don't think he's a refugee, but a wandering Jew, Neda said. But really. Isn't being a refugee like the main thing in Judaism? They left Egypt and wandered for 40 years. <laughs> yeah, a great sense of direction. <laughs> Just look at the map. It's not that far. Maybe. That's why the Israelis developed GPS. Uh, <laughs> for young brat, you have lots of information. Where did you get that? Uh, get shit like that? I, I read you tell me list. Meanwhile, the stranger woke up, rubbed his eyes, and began to recite uh, the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic. <laughs> Marco walked out to smoke and came back. Uh, the damn hail wrecked the new cement on the balcony. I'll have to do it again. And moreover, I didn't get paid this month. The construction company is broke. Nobody builds anything here anymore. He ate three, uh, three pale uh, bratwurst and drank a uh, few of plum brandy and smoked more. He stood up and walked to the larder and took out a slab of bacon and with a sharp knife sliced away the thick bottom skin and tossed it out the window to uh, the dog who growled uh, with the crash teeth. Then he gave a thin slice to Mimi who sniffed at it, walked uh, around the slice and tried to bury it with dust from the floor. <laughs> oh, you little bitch, shouted Marco. You're too fine for this? You think it's shit? It may be shit, but it's good shit. <laughs> Marco kicked the cat and the neda shouted, You asshole, how dare you? 
Don't talk to your father like that. Or what, or what, you'll kick me and beat me and teach me not to trust men? Look, it's not pop psychology, you brat. You can't talk to father like that. Leave my cat alone. Neda crawled to the cupboard, whispering nits nits, but Mimi hissed and spat and growled uh, from the narrow space between the tile floor and the plywood of the furniture, perhaps saying in her language, I've had enough of this. I'm going back to my treat. Next time, don't bother to look for me. I'll eat sparrows and mice, and they'll be better than the crap you've eaten. <laughs> Marco picked up the bit of bacon and threw it out the window to the dog, uh, and uh, he laid out uh, uh, the bacon on the cutting board and sliced and ate it raw and chewed with his jaw clanking. You disgusting pig, his wife said. Oh, lovely to hear your voice, he said. And, and what pig are you talking to? It's dead and not disgusting. And, and what is this? In this family only the dog likes me? The stranger has stopped whispering in her make. Marco offered him bacon and my mom said, do we have to explain again it's against his religion? Um, and the, the, there's a little bit, they, they talk in German, I don't need to... Uh, uh, so how come you speak uh, German? And, and uh, the guy says, oh, it's easy for me. Um, it's basically Yiddish. <laughs> you grew up among the Jews? Yeah. Who is your father? I have no idea. My mother says he disappeared in the Six Day War. And he left her pregnant with me before she got a chance to find out who he was. So where did you grow up? In East Jerusalem, near Herod's Gate. And how did you join this band of refugees? Who says I joined anything? Neither a follower nor a leader be. By the way, do you mind if I have another glass of wine? Not at all. The stranger drank half of it, stopping it off, uh, with water. You behave like a regular Dalmatian, said Marco. And he kept slicing bacon and chewing uh, while the stranger drank wine. Marco drank more plum brandy, stepped out the smoke, came back, chewed more bacon, uh, grew red in the face, gasped, and fell off the chair, which splintered into pieces. He made croaking sounds on the floor. My God, shouted Mom, he's having a heart attack. Do something, shouted Neda, but neither she nor Mom could move, shocked by the sight. Pretty soon Marco stopped moving, probably dead. Foam appeared in his nostrils, uh, reddish. A breath came out of him like the last air of a flat tire, and he grew still. Call an ambulance, for God's sake, said Neda. Mom shouted, oh my God, my God. Yes, answered the stranger. His lips were red from wine. All the cracks of skin healed uh, by the redness. Yes, what, Mom said. God is a good idea, said the stranger, especially now. You don't need an ambulance. There's not enough time. By the way, sometimes I talk to the Heavenly Father. You may think I'm crazy that I suffer from the Jerusalem syndrome, as many visitors of our beautiful city do. I think the Father will help us here. He kneeled on the ground, turned Marco on his back, and pumped his chest with his palms. Then he leaned over and did CPR for a minute. Marco groaned, inhaled deeply, coughed, and, sh and sat up. What happened? he asked and stood up with the stranger's assistance. You've had yourself a little heart attack. But you'll be all right, said the stranger and gave Marco a slap on the shoulder. I think you're better off drinking red wine, he said in Port Morlet. Maybe that's how you remember me when I'm gone. Mom said, how did you manage that? Are you a doctor? A Jewish doctor? I heard they're really good. They kept drinking all night long, listening to the stranger's stories, fell asleep, and when they woke up, they remembered not a single word of these stories, and both the stranger and Mimi were gone, not a trace of them. Neda found Mimi on Brothers Wolf Street atop the weeping Christmas tree, which had shed even more resin tears or, or for the sorry world, so that Neda's jeans got all sticky climbing it. As for where the wandering Jew was, uh, Mimi couldn't often answer in a language uh, these Croats would understand. So, but if you have uh, one or two questions I can answer, we are, we are done. Either way.